waiting, please ask questions in our Slack channel, mozfellows underscore speakers. You can see it in the calendar invitation. All right, without further ado, I would like to invite Alexander up. Cool. Hi, everyone. So uh, when I was 15, uh, I was diagnosed with depression. And a couple of months later, I was back to being perfectly normal and OK and happy, um, thanks to this little uh, green and white pill uh, you can see on the screen here. Um, and so when I went to med school a few years later, uh, I really wanted to know how these things worked. And it turns out we don't have a Scooby, how they work. Um, and one of the main reasons for this is that uh, people don't feel that confident in building off other people's research. Um, so I did a Twitter poll the other day, um, and more than a third of people said they uh, wasted a year of their research time trying to build on a finding that they now believe isn't true. Um, and so with research going like this, um, we're not going to make very quick progress. Um, so at the moment, this, this, is, this is what science looks like for the most part. Um, you collect some data, you do some analysis on that data, and then you use hypothesis tests to see how that fits in with your theory of how the brain works or how the rest of the world works. Um, and then you jumble all that together and you throw it into a PDF. And uh, as open scientists, we, we realize that maybe, maybe this isn't quite ideal. Um, so what, what we decide to do is, is we say, well, let's share our data uh, and let's share our analysis and people can check our work, they can reuse it um, in any way they want. But it turns out that's not actually that easy. It would take months to reuse everyone's data and analysis for every paper that's been published. So my project is to try and create formal links between um, and standards for all the data and the analysis that we do so that every time someone publishes a new study, they publish all of this along with the links and then when someone publishes something else that's linked to it, we could automatically use their data and the other person's pipeline or use their methods and the other person's data. Um, and so in this way, I'm hoping to bring uh, the same sort of principles continuous delivery has built to software development where we can um, redo tests every time we add a new feature, where we can recheck all the scientific theories every time we add a new piece of data or a new method. And uh, that's, that's my story. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking the time to be here. Uh, thanks again for allowing me to be in this group in this awesome opportunity. My name is Andrea. I'm a science fellow, and I feel a little bit like an oddball because I'm going to be working with hardware, and I think nobody else is doing that for this cohort at least, but at least I'm not alone in the world. There are more people in, which are depicted here uh, who are the people for the gathering of open science hardware, GOSH uh, for short. Uh, and it's an amazing group of people that I work together with. Um, so my whole trip with open source in science started uh, about eight years ago when I was sitting in the lab doing an experiment for my master's and, this, and realized there were uh, 60,000 euros worth of equipment in front of me. And as you can imagine, this is a gigantic barrier for people all around the world to do research, uh, healthcare, and all of these things because equipment is really expensive. So I started digging and looking for ways to do research in more affordable um, systems. Um, and luckily, this was about when the Arduino had more or less picked up uh, velocity. So I started researching those things and trying to implement those for my research. What really tipped me over the edge to go really open with the things I do was a talk, a TED talk um, from William here, who I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, he was by the, by back then he was 16 in the Malawi and his family was about to go into starvation because they, they had no rains uh, at that time. So he said, this, was a, this is a future I could not accept. So I went to the, he says, I, I went to the library and just by the pictures of the physics books, I could uh, build two windmills, one to pump water and one to generate electricity. And he says, just by the pictures, because he couldn't read English that well. And this was when I realized people just need access to information, right? Like they need access to the proper tools to like take charge of their own fates. Right? And this is when I started one project called Open Neuroscience, which deals a little bit with these things, but this is the very beginning of this journey. No time for that. 
what I want to work with uh, for my fellowship is how do we enable people to join the scientific endeavor by lowering the equipment access barrier. Um, you're going to excuse me here, but so without hardware, there is no science. We can have all the open data projects, all the code and everything, but if you don't have hardware, you cannot answer your own scientific questions, right? So people are not in charge of their scientific pathways. So this is why I care very much about this topic. Um, and therefore, this is what I want to work with. Um, so what I want to do is basically learn the needs and demands. So I'm gonna try to conduct a survey online to see what people need, uh, hopefully worldwide, and try to build tutorials so that people have starting points for their development and also try to start building prototypes in an open way, because definitely uh, the tools that you have available, let's say in Europe or in Canada are different from the tools you have available, let's say in South America. Um, and I know this for a fact, because this is where I'm originally from. So these prototypes and these tutorials should take in consideration this idea that every single environment is different and people should then be able to locally develop their own tools. Um, yeah. And so that's basically it. Um, just uh, some information, so the slides are going to be available for everyone. And luckily, um, I'm proud to say, if you want to learn more about um, open source hardware, um, I have wrote like a little piece which, was a pre which is a preprint available at that um, address. And I'm very happy to say that this was accepted for publication today, so soon you should be seeing yeah, in a, in a <laughs> journal next to you. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Aidan Bodelin, and until recently it was difficult to talk about everything that was wrong with how we safeguard privacy online without being mistaken for a science fiction writer. A lot of the concerns that I would raise would see me accused of fear mongering or claiming that the sky was falling, even if it was, and the references to George Orwell's 1984 ran wild, but things are different now. Uber had a catastrophic data breach and tried to cover it up. Equifax lost the personal and sensitive information of over 100 million Americans. And Cambridge Analytica amassed the Facebook data of millions upon millions of voters and used it to influence elections. So something is wrong. And as the internet has grown in importance, economically and socially in our everyday lives, one thing hasn't kept up with that change. And that is how we protect our online privacy. So the current approach that we have today for protecting privacy is something called notice and consent. And the idea behind it is super simple. Um, if I tell you how I would like to process your data, you can tell me what information I may have, whom I may share it with, and how I can use it. But there's just one problem. It doesn't seem to work. And I'd just like to do a quick straw poll of this room. Can you raise your hand, please, if you have read a privacy policy before? Okay, a lot of people. But, and can you raise your hand if you've read a privacy policy and found something within it that you found problematic? That's a lot of people. And have you read a privacy policy before, found something problematic, and then negotiated an opt-out or an exemption from complying with that clause? And we have two people for the, for the benefit of those who are not in the room who have raised their hands. And that's great. I'm glad that we've had some success there. But I think what we've also established is that even within this room where I would hazard a guess, we have an above average um, level of awareness of digital rights issues. For the most part, we find that privacy policies are something that we have no choice but to accept. And that is something that I find really problematic because notice and consent as a light touch tool that it emerged um, when the internet itself was an emerging piece of technology just doesn't work at protecting privacy, which is what, which is what it needs to do. So if the current approach is broken, um, I think now is the time to fix it. And that's what I'm going to be working on over the next 10 months at Mozilla. So broadly, there are two solutions to this problem that I see rules like regulations, or there are tools like technology. I'm going to be focusing on the first one because my background is in public policy. And so over the coming 10 months, I am hoping to understand the privacy behaviors, expectations, and preferences of internet users, 
and internet non-users because their data is being swept up too. And I'm hoping to, in a collaborative and multi-stakeholder fashion, uh, develop a series of policy briefs and ultimately a series of recommendations that I would like to see implemented in the future. So I've got a, a lot of questions to find answers to, a lot of people to speak with, um, market incentives and disincentives to understand, but um, ultimately I'm hoping to develop a regulatory toolkit which will include policy briefs and recommendations, um, trying to build a movement, doing some external outreach as well, communicating a message, amplifying it. And I hope that you will join me in some way along, along the next 10 months. So thank you very much. You can email me or reach me on Slack if you have any suggestions on the path forward that I should take. And thanks again. Hello. Um, and Marie, are these like compiled from this morning? Okay. I was I was hacking on these and I don't think it, it made it in, but that's fine. Uh, my name is Brett Gaylor. Uh, and the problem that I see is that the internet is in trouble and, and no one cares. Um, you, you all really care a lot and everyday people like my uh, father-in-law, they know there's something wrong, but they don't really know what to do about it. And they just keep saying the word creepy, but they don't know um, what, more that, what more that means. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I've made uh, a few documentaries about um, internet culture. So this is one from 2010, a long time ago in internet years called RIP, a remix manifesto. And this was looking at um, the sort of problems that we saw early in the 2000s about the way that the internet was changing our relationship with intellectual property. Um, made one called Do Not Track, which is an interactive film that used your privacy, your personal information to sort of make, to help you uh, realize how precious it is really. Uh, and it was a, a multi-part uh, project um, using your own personal data. And I've done lots of different things here at Mozilla um, for the last several years. But one that I'm really proud of is working with other fellows to think about the impact of their projects as they release them into the world. What kind of change do you want this project to make? Um, one fellow this summer released a project that was an investigation of Venmo, and I'm going to go into a case study on Thursday of this, but this is a headline that it created, which was basically, it's, stop, it's time to stop spending money on Venmo. So trying to think about how to change conversations about these issues is, is what I want to do in my fellowship. And so I'm making a documentary film with the, the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company. Uh, other Canadians are familiar with our old logo, but somebody made it with, with, with ham, with, with bacon. And I'm just going to show a quick uh, demo of this. Hopefully it'll work. Uh, and this is um, a documentary that will be available to every Canadian uh, sometime next year. Uh, we're, we have a public broadcaster, so I'm very privileged to be able to be able to play this on a federally mandated uh, system called television. Nothing beats it, really. Well, as I was saying, there's been a lot of concern about people's private information and how. I'm getting nervous about the internet. I want you to cut it off. Are you blowing bubbles? I'm gonna have to spank you. I didn't always feel this way. A decade ago, my feature doc, Rip, a remix manifesto, celebrated a new connected world that would revolutionize everything. Connecting people online has been my mission ever since. But these days, my faith in tech is shaken. Facebook says the personal data of up to 87 million people was allegedly used to predict the choices of American voters. How do we consume as much of your conscious attention as possible? The yellow cab industry is on the verge of collapse. Can you, can you turn it up, friend, in, in the back? The sound? by a cyber mob. We have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. If you think having tech companies know every detail of your online life is scary, what about the details of your real life? Meet the connected fork. It's collecting data about how many bites you have taken. This connected fridge knows what's for dinner, and this connected vibrator knows what's happening in your bedroom. It's all part of the Internet of Things. 
a plan to connect all the objects in your life, and it's the next wave of computing. It's estimated that by 2020, more than 75 billion devices will be connected this way. I traveled to Silicon Valley to understand the people crafting this agenda. My first stop was Target's Connected Home Store. I have the Google Home and the Amazon Echo, the Kinsa thermometer. Oh, I have the smart water bottle. What it's designed to do is take a little bit of information from you. So basically, how old are you? Are you male or female? Um, how tall are you? What's your weight? All those different kinds of things. And from there, basically tells you a recommendation of how much water you should be drinking hourly and daily. So do you ever worry about like that data leaking somewhere else? You're usually getting like your name, email address, um, weight, height, age, that kind of thing. So nothing that's super personal. <laughs> a glass house seemed like the right metaphor for the home of the future because cameras were everywhere. If your city is constantly being filmed and sensors are tracking you as you walk around with your mobile phone, are you more or less likely to attend a protest about something that might be oppositional to your government? I'll just stop it there because uh, there's lots more to learn from from colleagues. Um, but just to note that, um, whoa, um, in addition to a film, uh, we're trying to think about this as a, a sort of a documentary universe. So in addition to a film, um, we'll be collect we'll be allowing users to build their own kind of IoT devices. Um, and we kind of think of it almost like an advent calendar. So every two weeks you'd be sent sort of a set of uh, different technology, which you would say like, let's assemble this to be a um, home assistant, or let's reassemble this to be uh, a fitness tracker. Because to kind of get those aha moments, people need these devices in their home, but they're expensive, they're not evenly distributed. And the other problem there is even if you get an Echo into your home, you can't take it apart and you can't understand how it works. So we want to help people do that. Um, and I'm excited to learn from all of you. Thanks. I want to put it back. Present. Ah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Bruna, and um, I'm really happy to be here. So thank you, and I'm I really want to share experience with all of you. Your work seemed really great, and uh, I'm. I'm working with Article 19 Brazil and uh, as an Open Web Fellow, and uh, I have a background on community networks. And this picture uh, on the background, it's a free radio located in a public university in the city of Campinas. And that's pretty much where I started my activism with free software and free media and feminism and social movements. So. Um, uh, this radio uh, operated for 30 years and it was a really symbol in Brazil for free media and it was closed on December last year. Um, so uh, it was there that I started uh, asking myself questions related to gender and tax and I saw that uh, there were gender barriers for women to assess technology. And so we started to just plug and unplug everything to make uh, the radio working. And then we uh, were just making uh, antenna manutation and fixing and until we did our own transmitter and started uh, working with hardware also. Um, but uh, so what are community networks? I think uh, it's a broad range of definition, not only related to internet, but also to intranet and hybrid networks and uh, other kind of digital technologies, uh, including digital radio. Um, so, but in this fellowship, um, we are addressing intranet and internet, and there is this issue of internet access in, in Brazil. So 46% of urban households 
uh, don't have internet and 74 uh, in the rural areas. Uh, also, a lot of people only have access through mobile, which can be really restrictive. Um, so this is some points that uh, community networks uh, must have uh, that I agree with at the host organization. So self-manage, uh, autonomous infrastructures and uh, non-profit solidarity economy based. So I'll tell you about two quick examples and I have some more. So if you, if you are interested in knowing more about that, we can talk. This uh, was a project uh, I made in the beginning of this year. It was a low power FM radio in an indigenous territory and uh, a flowers lab with secondary uh, uh, school girls. And um, so in Article 19, we are planning on doing this hybrid networks with solar power to attend some communities in Amazonia and other uh, rural peripheries in Brazil. And the impacts we are expecting are the installation itself and uh, to broaden the, large, the, the knowledge on CNs and uh, spectrum management. Um, and also we want to create a, a flaws web platform and captive portal and for that I will need partnership so if any of you uh, feel like uh, collaborating I'll be really glad to hear about it uh, so thank you uh, this is my contacts and Videtas.org uh, is uh, this feminist and tech group we have. We have a server and some. Uh, we offer some alternatives to Google Docs and uh, Google Spreadsheets, so feel free to use it. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Bruna. Our next five presenters are Sierra Martinez, Clara Sal, Denai Tapia, Daniela Soderi, and Darius Kazima. Kazimi, excuse me. Sarah can feel free to come on up. Hey. Okay. So my name is Sierra Martinez, and I'm going to tell you about what I'm going to do this year as an Open Science Fellow. So I'm fascinated with how organisms get their shape, and this began as an inherent curiosity as a child, and that manifested in countless hours of drawing and photographing trees. And the question that always came to mind was, how does such beauty come to exist? How do organisms come to get the shape that they are in? Um, and it took a required biology course in college for me to realize the short answer is evolution. And immediately thereafter, I switched from art to biology and began pursuing a PhD in plant evolution. Um, so during my PhD, I spent um, many, many hours just measuring flowers, leaves, petals, stems, and the DNA sequences that process these, um, all these processes. And as you can imagine, this led to a lot of data, which resulted in a new love of mine, and that is the data itself. So we are in an incredible time to, that's supposed to be a heart. <laughs> We're in an incredible time to love data. Um, data is coming in at um, extraordinary rates. And I now consider myself a data scientist just as much as I consider myself an evolutionary biologist. Um, and recently I asked myself, what do I wanna do with these skills? Where is the coolest data? I wanna go where that is. And I came to the realization that the most amazing data has already been accumulating for hundreds of years and that is in natural history museums. So natural history museums began as private collections in the early 1600s. They were called cabinets of curiosity. And now they house billions of points of data describing our planet. So in the past 15 years, a monumentous and worldwide effort from many government agencies um, came together to digitize the collections of these museums. 
And this data is amazing. It ranges from thousands of drawers of butterflies to eggs of exotic birds, bones of mammoths, and thousands of other, and hundreds of other species of skeletons of animals that don't even roam the earth anymore. It provides an, an excellent snapshot of the world as we know it. Um, and it's especially needed as a resource to understand biodiversity on this planet, especially right now in a time of a very uncertain climatic future. So this data needs to be valued. This data needs to be protected. This, need, this data needs to be accessible and usable to the public and the researchers who want to make um, and help inform policymakers on the future environmental impact. So this year, myself and a team of scientists are exploring these databases and systematically surveying ways in which we can help bring this data to the forefront of biological education and research. So we're looking to find ways in which computational tools can be built um, to make this data more sustainable and easier to use. So we've created a um, website right now that it acts as a home base for our efforts. Right now, it's basically a data science blog. Um, and we hope to add more tools and tutorials on how to access this data and hopefully um, get this data in a more usable state. So selfishly, I'm most interested in this project because I want to play with this data with a bunch of um, data scientists um, to further understand this underlying question that has I've been following for the last 15 years, and that is how do organisms get their shape. So if, no matter your motivation, if any of you guys are interested in exploring this data with me, come find me. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Clara. And like um, many of you here, I care a lot about the internet, uh, but specifically content policy and online tools uh, that counter disinformation. So, uh, so in this presentation, I wanted to tell you things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to know about me on paper. Um, so I want to tell you guys what I care about, and hopefully we can work together uh, in a way that has synergy. So. Um, I'm very curious about a number of things, uh, and I've spent my time uh, in life trying to understand um, why people do what they do. Um, so in one summer where um, I wanted to understand war, I spent the summer shooting 50 caliber machine guns um, and then competing in a national beauty pageant because I wanted to understand beauty, uh, and, and specifically places that I don't quite understand. And um, I'm curious about other things too like religion. So I spent two years living in a church to really understand why people believe in the things that they believe. Um, and what's interesting about all these curiosities I have, um, I spent some time understanding alternative medicine, published and research in it, um, because I felt like it was something that not that many people understood. Um, but all of this, you know, strings together, I, I spent some time in STEM education. Um, is that it all, it all comes together in um, what we know today as uh, content online and content policy. There's ties to all these really interesting questions that PR people are asking and very different beliefs that people have. Um, so over the last two years, um, I've spent time analyzing homegrown radicalization online in the United States, why people join extremist groups. Uh, and then over the last uh, six months, focused on um, online disinformation, specifically around election security. Um, so that's a little bit about my curiosity. Uh, what am I motiv motivated by? So I'm a technology entrepreneur, and I'm very, very motivated by finding the limits of rules. Uh, to tell one story here, um, 
One of my favorite classes in college was physics, not because I loved it, I actually hated it, but it was really easy to figure out the rules. Um, typically on a physics exam, you can only, uh, professor will only test you by multi-part questions. So I only studied questions that you could get asked that were in multi-parts and I got great responses and great test results. <laughs> Didn't quite learn the content as much as I would have liked to, but you know, I, I think it's really fun to be able to find the limits of the rules that are undefined. Um, and I think when you think about content policy today, uh, a lot of these are, are really undefined around tools and uh, the, the amount of enforcement that takes place. Um, what do I want to accomplish? Um, I ultimately, out of all my work, want to bridge the digital divide. Um, and I'll tell a couple of stories here. Um, when I was in high school, um, my parents are divorced and um, did not have money to go to college. So I built a web crawler to uh, look up all the scholarships I could find and apply to everything I could. And I thought to myself, you know, this is great. Um, got, you know, full rides to college, but uh, I thought about the people that needed it the most and the literacy that they didn't have to be able to find these resources. And a lot of times information access is something that uh, is a strong barrier to anybody uh, being able to access anything. So I call that information inequality. Um, and the way that I think um, about solving this problem doesn't always have to require the most uh, high-tech tools. Um, in the picture, you'll see a check from Walmart. This was a tool that my uh, twin sister and I built at Tech Orange Disrupt a few years ago, where we built an SMS tool to help Walmart shoppers who uh, were not very familiar with uh, smartphones be able to find items in the store through text message. So um, think about the digital divide a lot, and I want to ultimately close it. So that kind of leads me to uh, my current body of work. Um, over the last few years, we've seen an explosion of tools and explosion of issues around online content and um, around disinformation as a whole. And people call it in different buckets. You can say disinformation is a form of terrorist use of the internet. You can see it as um, hate speech. There are many, uh, many issues that people bucket. And then there's a set of tools that people develop that are very issue specific. Um, so. In my next 10 months, I hope to classify these tools and start organizing them. Um, not only tools that address specific issues, but what kind of tools can we take from the private sector that have already been developed around reputational management, um, around cybersecurity? Uh, and how do we actually bundle and bucket this in a way that um, really can map to the terms of service of different online platforms? Um, terms of service are constantly changing. And in order for tools to be effective, in order for tools to scale, uh, this really has to come hand in hand if we want action to actually take place. Um, so just to come in full circle, what I'm curious about, understanding why people do what they do. You've heard some personal stories from me, but I think um, you know the content space is something that uh, is incredibly curious for me in understanding why people share what they do. Um, and then uh, how do I find the limits of the rules that bound the reason of how people act? And then finally, how do we bridge the digital divide? How do, we, uh, well, how do we help people that would not otherwise have access to information make informed decisions? Um, and then secondarily, um, one of my goals selfishly as a technology entrepreneur is I wanna help startups uh, really be able to understand these gaps those that don't have um, a large legal team to help them with counsel, how can they have a set of terms of service that is very smart and actionable? And how can they discover tools that have been built that they can quickly actionize upon um, content on their platforms? So thank you. Hi, um, that's the name of my project, maybe it's too long, but uh, I'd like to use the concept of transculturality uh, across the 
10 months, the whole 10 months that are coming. And this is a concept that is about the fluidity of identities that exist today. Uh, it's kind of an evolution that has separatory perspectives. Um, now, uh, race, uh, gender, and cultural identities are intermingled, and I think the digital environments should uh, embrace that too. Uh, who's that girl? Who's me? Uh, I'm Danae, I'm from Chile. Um, I think transculturality is relevant for me because of my own biography. I'm an immigrant in the Netherlands. I'm living there for three years. I live in Rotterdam and I'm studying a, a PhD in literary studies. Also, I did my bachelor in journalism. Um, these are some of the selected projects I've been working recently. This summer was amazing. I went to HOPE conference, the Hackers on Planet Earth, and I presented a research on a comparative analysis between the figure of the chairman and the hacker. I did also write, uh, I did also write for the Sucker, the journal of uh, Images and Mark Zuckerberg, a journal that uh, started at the MIT where I did some work on the visual representations of digital colonialism. I've also done a research on period trackers and their implications re regarding gender rights. Also, I've been researching um, feminist infrastructures. Uh, this is a project that, and a, a whole articulation that started at last Postfest. I used this uh, other Lord quote, which is the one in the in that square. Uh, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. It really made sense for me, and that that made sense of the whole uh, research. That made sense for me to do research on infrastructure. Uh, I'm also part of the Rise of Collective. I'm also, I, want, I also did a documentary about the, um, uh, all this era where we downloaded music illegally into our computers. I've also been studying, been studying digital intersectionality, and I think I have a weird cyber universe of Twitter bots I created, weird videos, weird writing, and the internet is exciting for me, very exciting, but for but the recent years, it's not that exciting anymore. Now it's boring, now it's surveilled, and I think that we have to do something, and I want to do something. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, there's plenty of threats to the open web, the surveillance, the capitalism, uh, but for this particular project, I'm going to concentrate in the lack of dissident discourses and how we are surfing in this dystopic ecosystems where alternative positions have to operate in the margins. Um, this was like an assignment from the fellows in, in from Mozilla preparing a paragraph of what impact do we want to have in the world. And I think that I managed to do this. <laughs> I want to promote uh, digital technologies as a space for transcultural expressions. I want to fall in love with the internet again and think about her as a territory of creative resistance. Which tactics am I going to use this month? I'm thinking of doing an involvement with migrant communities across the globe. Um, I live in this Turkish Dominican neighborhood in Amsterdam. I want to uh, be, I want to work with them. I want to work with uh, migrant communities in Chile in Latin America. I want to do a study of the digital uses of transcultural individuals and groups. And regarding outputs, I'd like to do some multimedia artistic project and move away from the more formal research that no one's no one's going to read, and with conclusions that all everyone knows beforehand. I'm, I'm a researcher, I love to do research, but I want to take the risk in this fellowship and be more experimental because I think that way it will, the final product will inspire more people. That was my presentation, thank you.
everyone. Uh, this is so inspiring to be here. Thank you all for organizing and for being here uh, today. Uh, my name is Daniela. I'm a, a neuroscientist. There are many neuroscientists in the room. It's great. We're everywhere. Uh, and I study specifically how um, attention, uh, effort, and even movement affect the way how we perceive sound. But I'm not here today to talk to you about that, uh, but more about like the project in open science that I've been working uh, in the past year. Uh, so as a scientist, I spend most of my time thinking about experiments and performing them. But the most important part for a scientist is actually to uh, share that knowledge with other researchers, because that is how we advance knowledge and, uh, and scientific discovery. Uh, so the golden standard for us is to uh, then publish our research in a uh, journal, uh, scientific journal. And the way how we do that uh, is that we send our manuscript after publication and the, to a specific journal and the editor will pick it up. And if he likes it or she likes it, uh, it will be sent to uh, out for peer review. And what that means is that two or three um, other scientists that are hopefully familiar with my research will read my manuscript and spend their volunteer free free time uh, evaluating it and making sure that everything is, is correct, you know, that's, at least that's, what, that's the hope, uh, and uh, giving me feedback. Uh, so that is uh, pretty straightforward, right, um, and easy, uh, except that it isn't. And most of the time, this process is not straightforward at all. And it, it involves a long back and forth between the authors, between me, and between the editor. And it can take up to one year bef between the time that I submit my research and that actually that gets published. So uh, this might not seem like a problem, but uh, it actually is because it's, it's accelerated decelerate and actually in the uh, uh, hinder. I don't know, but like slows up uh, scientific discovery. Um, and so I, for a long time, thought that this was the only way that we could share science uh, and our research. Uh, but uh, until I learned about uh, something, a solution that physicists have figured out about 25 years ago, which is kind of mind blowing. Um, and that's preprints. So preprints are the same manuscript that I just told you about, but instead of going through this long process, I as an author and then a scientist can upload this to the internet, magic internet, in less than 24 hours. And that's gonna be, mean that my science is open access and it's open available to everyone um, in, in such a short time. And so, after I learned about preprints, I came back to my institution and I was like, why aren't we doing this? Uh, and I asked, you know, lots of answers uh, uh, to that question, but I also started like learning about what the many advantages of preprints are. And one of my favorite was actually the fact that the community can give feedback before it's too late because preprints are, are citable, are like objects that are complete, but also they can be versioned. So it means that I as an author can take the feedback from you guys and say, oh, that's that I can make my science better. And before I put it in, you know, write it into a scientific publication that's unchangeable, I can do something. And so what I started promoting is the usage of preprints at journal clubs. Journal clubs are meetings that we all have as researchers uh, pretty regularly. Um, and we discuss science is already published. Uh, but the problem that I always had with that is that all the amazing discussions remain trapped in those rooms. And there is no way for us to share the knowledge, that feedback with the authors. And if, if they were a way to do that, the authors would have no way to change because it's already it's already published so that's um how I started actually encouraging discussing preprints at Journal Club. And that turned that conversation, just like I'm having with you today, uh, about a year ago with another neuroscientist, kind of uh, spearheaded a project that uh, took the name of pre-review, which is post-read and engage with preprint reviews. Uh, and they started as a platform for sharing preprints online and getting credit for those reviews. Uh, reviewers now are us, community members, and, um, and you know, we started building tools and resources for researchers to do so. Uh, but what I want to focus on, because I think it's the biggest challenge for us, is to actually change the culture within academia and these ideas that only very senior researchers that have worked on that project for 30 years are able to provide feedback. Actually, we can provide feedback as students as well, uh, but we need to do it uh, so constructively and to start gaining uh, uh, rewards for those contributions. So what I want to work on is to really like uh, leverage what I'm learning here from Mozilla and their amazing ability to build community and bring this to academia and then bring this concept of openness, uh, openness there. So um, thank you so much for listening and uh, Hi, 
Hi, everybody. I'm Darius Kazemi. I'm a programmer and artist based in Portland, Oregon in the USA. And uh, I make weird internet stuff under the name Tiny Subversions. I uh, also co-founded a creative technology cooperative called Field Train. Uh, if you're interested in tech co-ops, we published all of our legal documentation with annotations. I'll talk to me about that later. And uh, I do a lot of open source work. Uh, by weird internet stuff, I mean things like the Random Shopper, which is a project I did a few years back where I gave a bot an Amazon gift card and it bought random crap for me and shipped it to me. Um, uh, glitch logos, it's a, one of my many Twitter bots. It sort of glitches up corporate logos and sometimes I put them on t-shirts. And uh, Corpora is a, is a big open source project that a lot of people use that's lists of public domain stuff, well, or, sorry, public domain lists of stuff. So we have everything from like the birds of Antarctica to famous wrestlers to interpretations of tarot cards. Um, for this project, I'm going to be working with Code for Science and Society. They're the stewards of the DAT project. DAT's a peer-to-peer -peer data sharing protocol. Uh, imagine HTTP, but over BitTorrent or something like it. Um, I won't go into details, but the point is it could be a foundational technology for future decentralized web services. Um, my proposal to CSNS is that the decentralized web is kind of boring right now. Um, it's a lot of people cloning existing centralized services. Um, I don't think we need another Twitter but decentralized. I don't think we need another Facebook but decentralized. What I hope to do is figure out things that are only possible to do with decentralized technology so that we can make new tech rather than just cloning old tech. Um, basically bring some imagination to the process. Uh, so I'm going to spend the first couple of months doing research into the decentralization ecosystem generally. I'm going to be making a whole bunch of stuff, hopefully. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to be working on communicating it through, you know, blog posts and interviews with media and talks at conferences and fun demos and videos and all sorts of things. Um, I don't really know what I'm going to build, but my hope is that uh, whatever I build will be something weird like the Random Shopper, uh, something that makes people scratch their heads and go, that's really neat. I had no idea that was even possible. Tell me more about this decentralized web. Thanks. Our next five presenters are Gabby Ivins, Julia Londes, Gadija Ferryman, Maggie Holy, and Maya Rickman. Hi, I'm Gabby. Um, I'm yeah an Open Web Fellow with Witness this year. Uh, I live in Berlin, Germany, um, but I'm British, so I wrote a poster that says "Speak slowly" because we tend to talk quite fast. Um, so I'm an open source investigator, uh, which means something slightly different than the other open source. I say that we're without a hyphen, and that's the difference. Um, we can be within human rights organisations or individuals acting alone. Um, where the idea behind us is that we find publicly available data to tell different stories and narratives around human rights violations. Um, so we're very similar, I suppose, to intelligence agencies. Uh, we just have completely different resources, access levels, um, motivations. Uh, we rely on free and open source tools that often don't work or change quite quickly. Um, and our goal is to change uh, narratives. Um, and to address power imbalances. Um, so a little bit about me, I worked for an organization called the Syrian Archive, uh, which collects videos of the Syrian conflict um, that were getting taken down from YouTube. So right now we have 1.5 million videos in our data set, um, and we have to find ways of verifying them and as a way of analyzing this huge amount of data that we have. Um, eight years ago, I was an intern in a criminal court in Cambodia where I spent most of my time uh, reading witness testimonies of genocide um, with little support for anyone who worked there. Um, now I'm seeing that that hasn't really changed much in the environment that I work in. Uh, there's little support for the kind of content that we all see on a daily basis. So we're seeing videos from social media platforms but also being sent them via WhatsApp, uh, on our phones. Um, 
So a large part of the project I want to do is around vicarious trauma and secondary stress, um, which is what, why I'm glad there's so many neuroscientists in the room uh, to help me think about this. So this is as part of the Open Web Fellowship, the two areas I want to focus on is preserving this valuable content that has been put online uh, on social media platforms that is at risk of being taken down and preserving the well-being of those looking at it. And by looking at it, I mean people like me, but also content moderators. So these are the two kind of aspects I'm interested in. Uh, luckily, there's lots of people also working in, around content takedown. Uh, last year, YouTube uh, put up a new algorithm for flagging extremist content, and uh, 400,000 videos were taken down uh, around the Syrian conflict. Um, nearly half of those have been reinstated since then, um, but this kind of thing can happen all the time. So we're working, I'm working with Witness to talk about platform accountability, content takedowns, how they work, uh, why you get emails like this to say your video has been taken down. That's my alter ego, which you'll see quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, and the last thing I'll be working on is the fact that we have a huge amount of data to sift so we can collect it, but then how do we analyze it? So I'm also working on some ideas around machine learning um, and especially machine learning around trauma. Um, so. I, yeah, and then I'll be working with Witness. So I just wanted to say as kind of uh, an ask for collaboration, um, I'm really keen to talk to everyone and if anyone has done anything around surveying human subjects or um, yeah, psychology, machine learning, uh, I'd be really thrilled to talk to you. So thank you. Hi, I'm Julia Lowndes, and I'm really excited to tell you about Openscapes, which is my plan for opening up the landscapes and culture of environmental science. Um, open practices have really been game changing for me as I've been at NCs and with the Ocean Health Index for the last five years, um, so much so that I've actually been moving away from doing my own research so that I can focus my efforts on enabling others. So a little bit about me. Um, this is me in graduate school. Uh, that's a 40 pound Humboldt squid in my arms. And, and I'm releasing it back into the ocean after having put an electronic tag on it. So I was really interested in understanding where this squid was swimming, what its behavior was, and what impacts it was, it was having on its ecosystems and on fisheries in California. Um, that tag is going to be collecting data every second. So it's this really rich uh, data set that would tell me a lot about the system I wanted to understand. Um, so was, this is a really, really cool project and I was really passionate about it, but um, I hit some big problems pretty immediately, um, mainly because a big unsung part of science is data analysis which today means coding, and it means coding deliberately, transparently, reproducibly, collaboratively. And all of that were skills that a marine biologist or an environmental scientist do not get formally in training. So it was super demoralizing to have this passion and this training and not be able to work with my own data. I basically felt like this. This is Luke from Star Wars when he has this huge task ahead of him, this big challenge, and he does not have the skill set to be able to handle this on his own. Super demoralizing. And this is how I felt over 10 years ago when I started my PhD work, but it's still how a lot of environmental scientists feel today. And environmental scientists are studying really incredible things like food systems, disease ecology, things that are really important and time sensitive as climate change is affecting everything. And it's, it's just, a, I think, a travesty that we feel like this when it comes to working with data especially because there are better tools out there and practices. Um, I totally believe that open data science and open practices are like the force from Star Wars. You know, Yoda's here tackling this challenge that Luke never thought was possible. 
Um, and Luke is going to be able to learn these practices, and then that's going to broaden his imagination for the, the, the things he'll take on in the future. So I think that if we could get more environmental scientists feeling like Yoda and being a Jedi, we would be able to take on a lot more things. And I also, in my experience, think that, um, like Luke, some of the biggest barriers to engagement are being aware that better practices exist and having confidence um, in order to build those skill sets themselves, himself, ourselves. Um, so that's where OpenScapes comes in. This is my plan um, to engage, empower, and amplify environmental scientists and welcome them into the open practices community. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, build awareness and excitement. And I'm going to do this through storytelling with Star Wars, but also through sharing the story um, of my Ocean Health Index team and our path to better science in less time using these tools. Um, the next is to empower people by helping them develop confidence and skills. And this is really exciting because I can connect scientists to existing tools, existing communities, existing practices, and help um, really get their research going. Um, and the next thing is to amplify their successes and to build more champions and to build more communities and connect us all so that we can really change the culture of environmental science. So I really appreciate being here at Mozilla and learning from everyone here, and I'm excited to see what we can all do. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Khadija Ferryman. I am uh, an open science fellow, and I am the social scientist, kind of, I'm representing for the social scientists in the open science uh, fellows class. So I am a cultural anthropologist by training, um, and my research broadly focuses on health risk and how it's defined culturally and socially and what some of the impacts are. Oops. Yes, no, that's right. Okay. Um, so I believe that we are in the midst of a digital health uh, revolution, and this digital health revolution hinges on data. Um, so from genomics to Fitbits, the, there's hope that um, this large amount of data will help us bring, help us build the medicine of the future. And this is sometimes referred to as personalized medicine or precision medicine. And to explain precision medicine, let me give you a scenario. So imagine yourself in the future, you go into your doctor's office and your, your physician opens up your electronic health record and it has all kinds of information about you, your genetic sequence, your mobile health data, data from trackers and sensors that you wear, as well as social data Data, data about your social networks, um, environmental data, air quality data, housing quality data. And from all of this data, your clinician would be able to um, have a really good sense of what your risks are for various kinds of illnesses and be able to treat you even before illnesses kind of start to emerge. And you too, on the other side, would have open access to your health data and be able to talk with your physician and sort of change this relationship, have kind of a consultative relationship with your, with your physician, um, and you would come to kind of treatment plans together. So this is, this, this is the idea of, of precision medicine. And so this sounds great, right? But what could go wrong? And I know that this is a sophisticated data group um, here. And so I, I can imagine that as I was listing out the various kinds of data that your clinician might have, some of you in the audience were maybe already getting a little bit suspicious about kind of what could go wrong. Um, and oops. Oh, yes. OK, there we go. Um, and so there are signs already that precision medicine, even though we aren't there yet, that there are problems, especially with the data that's being used to power precision medicine. And so I'll just give you, show you a couple of examples, uh, talk about them briefly. So this is from uh, an article that was published in the New York, uh, New England <laughs> Journal of Medicine that described the way uh, this genetic, this test um, that was used to sort of tailor people's blood thinner was, um, 
worked for some people in the population, but not for uh, people of African ancestry. And that's because the data that was used to power the uh, research that identified those genetic variants was not accurate. A similar story with Plavix, which is a blood thinner. So the attorney general in Hawaii is actually suing the maker of this blood thinner because it doesn't work as well in Asian populations, again, because of the research. We're also seeing this with Alzheimer's research. Uh, there are some evidence or there are some health tools being built to uh, predict the onset of Alzheimer's, but when uh, after the tools built and sort of circulized, uh, circulated, uh, the makers realized that it only works for uh, Canadian English speakers um, and not for other people. And again, because of the data that was used to build this predictive Alzheimer's tool. And one last example, there are uh, various health tools being built to detect skin cancer, but the databases that are being used to power those um, overwhelmingly uh, include data from lighter skinned individuals and so they're not as accurate for other kinds of people. So we go from the dream of what precision medicine could be and kind of what we're already seeing now uh, as what can be problematic. So I started looking into this field and trying to understand kind of where some of the potential for bias and um, discriminatory outcomes could be. And so I spent the last year and a half, and I, I should say I'm also at the Data and Society Research Institute in New York City. Um, so I spent the last year and a half trying to kind of understand all of these different kinds of data, where they were being, how they were pulled in, being pulled into these systems and where the possibility for bias and discriminatory outcomes could um, enter into the system. And so this research was uh, published earlier this year, but there's still uh, a lot of work to be done. And the, the response to the work has, has shown that this is really an important issue that really isn't getting that much visibility. And part of what I wanna do in the fellowship is, is to continue to kind of raise this issue of there is, these health tools are being built um, at a very fast clip, but there isn't a lot of attention to sort of how these health data can be biased and what we can actually do to, to intervene. So, to go a little bit deeper into what I wanna do in the fellowship. So what I learned from my initial stage of research is that there are multiple forms of data, but electronic medical record data, um, many of our respondents pointed out is especially problematic. And that is because there are often software engineers um, behind the computer kind of making judgments about what health data means. Um, and they often don't have a clinical background. And even when they try to bring in clinicians to help them decide what health data means, um, the clinicians kind of don't offer much assistance because they argue themselves about what clinical data means. So there's a growing uh, trend of kind of software engineers reading, interpreting, and making decisions about health data that then is used to power these um, health data tools. And so what I wanna focus on is, as an anthropologist, really kind of do some in-depth ethnographic work with software engineers, with clinicians, with others who are building these health tools to really understand uh, how these processes of data cleaning and interpretation um, and dissemination and, and kind of becoming tools, how these processes actually work. Um, um, so that we can uh, get some more visible, get some more visibility around these processes, and I plan to develop a number of case studies around specific examples of health data tools, um, and begin to also bring software engineers and clinicians together to talk about if these biases are here, how can we stop them from spreading? Uh, so that is the last bit. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Maggie. I'm really excited to meet all of you. Uh, so I'm gonna be working during my fellowship with the Tor project as a user advocate, but I'm also going to be working on my own to build a more compassionate internet. So to sort of illustrate why compassion is so important online today, I'm gonna tell you my personal online harassment story. So it's gonna be super cheery and fun. Um, so over the last three years, I worked in video gaming and specifically, I did a lot of player support in online video games. And as you can imagine, this was a lot of sort of digital face-to-face -face conversations. And um, one day I was sitting in 
a uh, channel, a public chat channel, um, answering questions for players. And uh, this private message window opens up. And in it, this player asks me to come to the cockpit of his spaceship in the game and have sex with him. And he explained it in explicit detail what he wanted to do with me. Uh, so clearly this was upsetting. Um, I recorded the whole thing. I like took screenshots. I got the uh, player's profile information and I took it to my manager and his response was just, what do you want me to do? Just ignore it. Don't let it ruin your day and get back to work. So I had zero support in this situation and uh, beyond, of course, my regular 15 minute break, which I spent crying in the stairwell. And this is not the only instance of online harassment I've experienced, and it's not even the worst case of online harassment. So uh, if we wanna look at how intense uh, online harassment can get, we just have to look at Gamergate. Um, I can't talk a lot about it because I don't have a lot of time, but if you wanna talk about it later, please come see me. Um, so Gamergate was this targeted online harassment campaign um, in which people from marginalized groups were targeted for uh, super intense harassment that in some cases made them fear for their lives. And it pushed a lot of people offline, out of their careers and out of their hobbies. And Gamergate didn't just end with harassment in video games, it actually fed the alt-right and brought that movement to where it is today and uh, was hugely influential in the 2016 presidential election in the US. Um, so clearly, toxicity and harassment online are at a really critical point. And the question now is, how are we gonna make the internet feel safer? Um, so what I'm planning to do is, first of all, research the current state of anti-harassment measures online, see what work is working and what measures are just not working because clearly we can do so much better in so many areas. And then I'm going to take that information along with what I'm learning uh, in my work with the Tor Project and I'm gonna create an online community where victims can go not only for resources to get help but also just for support so that they feel heard. And then finally, and I think most importantly, I'm going to encourage social media and video game companies to actually take responsibility. Um, and <laughs> I wanna work together with them to implement better strategies to prevent harassment to begin with. And also just encourage them to provide at least a minimum amount of support for victims of the harassment that will inevitably happen on those platforms. Uh, so all in all, I pretty much just wanna make sure that victims of online harassment are not left alone in this fight. So that's it. Thank you so much for your time. I'm a different person. <laughs> Maybe my uh, presentation didn't get in before 9.30 in the morning. And, hey, Anne-Marie, could, okay, thanks. <laughs> Momentary technical difficulty. We're gonna have, um, a non-cohort fellow, Richard Witt, discuss openness by design. Yes. Sorry, yeah, come on up.
I like that the theme today is how much a joy technology is, especially Google Slides. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I think pretty much everybody uh, in this morning's session so far has talked about openness, mostly in positive terms. Uh, and I'm certainly will join in that chorus. But what I'm actually going to be doing for the next 10 months of Mozilla is trying to delve into greater detail about what openness really means. Um, the challenge is it's a concept that's widely admired, and yet I think oftentimes misunderstood. And increasingly, and I, my concern is it's being misused. Uh, in my 30 years of working in the telecom and internet space, I've seen countless beneficial uses, uh, and we've addressed many of them today. But you can think of some examples of things that were, we have uh, confusion and, in fact, misapprehension about openness. And here's a few that I've listed here. Uh, net neutrality at the FCC, good example. We've used the term open internet to describe net neutrality. And yet both the proponents and opponents of net neutrality claim that they are either restoring or taking back uh, openness, depending upon your perspective. So the FCC chairman even, even said he's restoring openness for the first time. Open APIs, the Cambridge Analytica situation with Facebook, many have claimed the API situation there were too open. Open standards, if you look at Android, the EU fined Google $5 billion because Android was not, quote, open enough. Um, and then even open source, Mozilla just this past spring uh, developed a dichotomy demonstrating there are no fewer than 10 different types of open source projects around the world with varying factors involved. And then we've also talked this morning again about open networks, open data, science, government, et cetera. So what's the impact I'd like to have here is to develop what I'm calling an openness by design project. Openness meaning this thing which is in fact not a thing, but it's more of a process, it's more of a mindset. And then design meaning it's not something that happens ad hoc, it's not something that's knee jerk, it's not an absolute even. It's a matter of a continuum of things between being more open and more closed. A few initial takeaways. Um, if you look at this from a systems perspective, you have things that are openness and enclosure that coexist in all types of systems, from the basic physical systems to the natural biological world, to the human world, even to our mindsets. There are no, in fact, no absolutes here. It's, it's a, not a set of polarities. If you have a completely open system, it dissolves into nothingness, right? If you have a completely closed system, it asphyxiates and dies from lack of oxygen. So what we're talking about is basically gradations between two different types of polarities, and it's a continuum of trade-offs uh, with no stasis or optimal end goal in mind. So one of the things I'm suggesting in my initial uh, take in the research is that there are various dimensions, which include the resource you're talking about, which often, for example, is code. It could be about the process or the rules involved, and it could be about the entities or the players. And in each of these situations, there's a, there's a degree of accessibility, inclusiveness, transparency, but then there are also trade-offs in terms of certain constraints that are built into each of these uh, different concepts. Uh, so the stretch goal is how you define openness, not just for technology systems and networks and platforms, but actually for human beings. What are we, when we look think about openness, how should we approach the way that technology is increasingly used as tools and implements in our daily lives? Um, and the preliminary thesis I have is, if you look at the open internet as this one example, the large platform companies, and you can pick your favorite examples, um, have benefited enormously from the relative openness of the internet, right? They've got access to data, they've got access to devices, they use the cloud, they use all the different access networks people have put together over the years to access the, quote, internet. And this thesis is perhaps they've not yet given back sufficiently in terms of what they have gained out of these systems. So are there ways we can change this, what I consider an asymmetric power dynamic, in some rather substantial, if not radical ways, looking at data, looking at devices, computation and networks as for particular areas for or dimensions to look at. Can we bring openness for the human being into these systems, into these ways of thinking that actually create a different competitive, hopefully more powerful dynamic for the average individual in terms of their interactions with the internet? With that, thank you very much. All right, our last but certainly not least round of fellows presenters are now Maya Rickman, Fee Rickrian, Sam Moorhead, 
Selena Musetta, Stefania Koskova, Sukbir Singh, Tarun Krishnakumar, Valentina Pavel. All right, Maya, you're up. <laughs> I'm having a bit of an identity crisis. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> I'm Maya, not by or Richard. Um, so I was asked to think about a moving story to share with you all today, something that really illustrates the challenges that LGBTQTI face on a daily basis. And I was struggling to think of something, not because there aren't enough examples, but because there are too many. Every day I hear stories from my friends, from my roommates on the internet of what it's like to be trans or queer all around the world. And it's so embedded and it's so constant, <laughs> the kind of pain that you hear and that you've heard today in part, um, that I just didn't know where to start. But I have one example, uh, which kind of illustrates a serious challenge that LGBTQTI face as they navigate the dating world. So last year, we saw the arrest of 54 individuals uh, in Egypt under the suspicion of homosexuality. Many were eventually convicted of the crime of inciting immorality, and social media and dating apps had a huge part to play in the entrapment of these individuals. So there are fewer and fewer places for queer people to meet, and Grindr, a dating app, is one of the most popular uh, options if you aren't safe in meeting often in, in public spaces like bars. And imagine that you get a message from someone, and in addition to feeling nervous about where that might lead, you also have to consider the possibility that it's not real at all, that you're being catfished by a police officer, and you're about to be arrested for just simply being who you are. Although it's not really a happy ending, Grindr has been working with Article 19 to think about design changes to the app to help protect queer people around the world. So advocating to really large companies like Grindr is important, but it isn't enough. And the alternative uh, is the security rhetoric of protect yourselves. For too long, I think security has been perceived as an individual's responsibility. And activists are told to download apps, to check their privacy settings, which many of us don't even check, and to use secure platforms. And the changes often rely and depend a lot on product design, cybersecurity laws, and whether Mercury is in retrograde or not. I mean, there's a lot of things to consider. So, if a single individual uses these tools, but the organization they're embedded in doesn't, then what impact does it leave them with? So currently, here you can see a lot of different uh, websites. A lot of them have really good content, but it's very individual. Are you a single youth? Are you, how do you protect your device? What is your personal relationship to technology? Um, what I'd like to talk about is our organizational or collective responsibility around security. So in order to build incremental and long-term long change around culture, we need to do it together. And there need to be tools to do that. And these tools are just the beginning. This personal relationship to technology is just the beginning. So during the course of my fellowship, I want to help activists, specifically LGBTQTI, think about how they can build security culture within their collectives. And it could be a series of games. It could be offline activities. Um, the point is that it facilitates conversations and it will build off existing resources. And I also aim for the resource to be holistic and feminist and really bring in a lot of the work around healing justice that activists have already been engaging in. So I will be working with Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice and I will be uh, pushing this forward. So thank you so much.
Hi. Este, uh, my English is not the best, and that is the reason why I prefer my, uh, read my presentation. Sorry for that. Um, perfect. Um, my name is Ruben, uh, but you can call me Fi. Uh, I am part of a project called Hashtag Segura Digital. And, bueno, the people think I, uh, I am an uh, expert in digital security. That is not, that is not true. That is a, a good description for me. It's a paranoid people, uh, digital paranoid people. <laughs> and that. Um, I am, okay. My fellowship will be hosted by Derechos Digitales, an organization based in Chile. Uh, Derechos Digitales is one of the main actors in the defense of privacy, freedom, expression in the internet, digital citizenship, and, and other things. Yeah, slide three. Uh, on Mexico, as in many other countries of Central and South America, there are presidents of governments and companies uh, threatening, threatening, uh, and companies threatening neutrality, privacy, and the open web health. Uh, the context in Latin America is quite similar to others in the world. Uh, we share common threats where diverse actors are, are also using the same web to, tar to target certain communities. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I believe uh, an open web should guarantee the respect to user safety and privacy. Uh, during this fellowship, I will work in on questioning uh, opening and sharing conclusion about digital security methodologies that my team and I working on the hashtag security project have tested. Also on creative interactive tools, okay, sorry. Ah. Also on creative interactive tools that can be used in other contexts, uh, building community with specific groups and experience as also how open hardware can be part of this thoughts. <laughs> um, the goal is for these methodologies and tools to be applied in other constant and uh, in other contexts and to transmit the strategic thinking, which means to share the information needed for every every user to be able to make their own decisions and develop, develop the, um, their own criteria. Right? Uh, I want to share more uh, understanding around how technology works and what are the particularities of the context we are immersing in and to kick off the, uh, on, to kick off a discussion around the problematic, the impact, uh, the problematics that impact the web. Uh, slide five. <laughs> Uh, this methodology and tools will be built to be replicable and adaptable in a simple and intuitive way. Uh, I will be working on consolidating a community of open web defenders in Mexico uh, to help trainers communicate amongst each other, uh, also, uh, also with communities that see the rights of vectors on the web, so such as um, particularly uh, young women, journalists, human rights defenders, uh, among others. Um, it will be key to be active across the machine and community while working in the project, uh, for it to be strong and have a global impact. <laughs> uh, slide six. Uh, I want to thank to Mozilla Foundation and Port Foundation for this opportunity. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know you, uh, learning for you all, and collaborating on projects. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Sam from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and when I first heard about open source, it was when I was working here at uh, Power Rangers. Um, and uh, it was kind of frustrating because I was in this big corporate structure and I was this tiny little cog in a um, giant well-oiled machine. 
And I was frustrated that all the people around me who were all very intelligent and curious and interesting, um, they weren't very able to exercise their creativity. Only a very few within the big company were actually able to, to do that. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I latched on to open source so strongly when I first heard about it. Um, the idea of collaborating on shared projects and adapting them to different needs made perfect sense to me. And I think this is also because humans have always done this. I mean, every folk song, every fairy tale, every traditional recipe uh, has been updated and adapted and, and remixed thousands of times. Um, you even saw Julia doing it just before with uh, Star Wars. And this is a very human, natural thing. Uh, We've been the, the kind of fluidity of culture, the way that we can fork and transform and adapt um, stories and, and culture is uh, something that fits really well with the open web uh, and open source practices. Unfortunately, it doesn't fit so well with big media. Uh, wherever you look, whether in music or uh, film or publishing or design, the main strategy still seems to be stop people from copying, adapting, and distributing culture. And unfortunately, uh, these large corporate creative industries have a lot of power and far more resources than we do. In fact, uh, they are, uh, they're always gonna be fighting to kind of make the open web more centralized, more censored, less open, and less creative. Something more akin to um, cable TV, but with likes. And just last week, we lost another battle in, uh, uh, for the open web in the EU. Um, and this was on the back of, there were propaganda campaigns basically saying that we needed more restrictive copyright laws for the sake of artists to protect artists. And so I think that we need more artists in our movement. Um, we need to be able to provide uh, them ways of um, making a living, not uh, making a living with open web practices rather than against them. Um, and we need to be more targeted and affected uh, in, in our campaigns to, uh, in, in much wider, more diverse contexts. I know that we can inspire artists with open processes. I've been doing workshops, um, making zines, using um, a photocopier as a version control system. And I see the enthusiasm that people have when they build on other people's work. And I see the delight in their eyes when they see a work that they've created be taken and remixed and turned into something else entirely. And that these two ideas can still live on and evolve separately. Um, and I know that there's ways that we can uh, give artists ways of um, doing work that is for causes rather than corporates. This is from an animation uh, which is entirely open source. It can be used by any freedom of information activist group, um, and it can be adapted to different cultural contexts, change colors and so on, change storylines. Um, the activists can do it themselves. They can play, maybe it's not. Um, or they can pay me to do it. So that's a business model that works not despite using an open license, but because it uses an open license, and I want to find more of them. So I'm going to be exploring this idea with uh, the Creative Commons Network, um, looking to find ways that uh, illustration and design can be used, um, open source illustration and design, uh, to strengthen their digital campaigns. Um, and I'm not talking about doing that as a centralized headquarters that uh, has one vision and submits that on the, the different chapters, but rather working with the different chapters to build on one another's work and co-create visual storytelling together. I think that's the diversity and creativity that we need for our open web to survive and to build the empowering and inspiring future internet that we need. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Can you all hear me? OK, great. I'm Selena. You can call me Slammer as well. Um, my first slide I have to put up because it's an ode to my DJ crew anthology of booty. Um, my identity as a privacy and security practitioner started more than 10 years ago on the dance floor with them. And for me, the dance floor is a political space for black and non black LGBTQI people of color. It functions as a place of creative resistance um, and liberation. And when AOB decided to throw parties, it was with that in mind. We wanted to provide a safer space where folks could express desire and move without being policed. But we need to do that. We have to channel our values, 
whether it was the flyers and the email pr promo we created, the bouncers we had to have a chat with about respecting our people, the acts we booked, uh, the signage we put up, our incident response plan when something wild came up like police being called or unwanted touching by a patron. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna let you know when the next slide comes up. Um, or um, unwanted t touching by a patron. And all of that organizing had to strive to reflect our fight against white supremacy, anti-blackness, homophobia, and misogyny. Now, my journey as a security practitioner has expanded now that I'm a, a web developer and a digital security consultant, but the values are the same. Um, could you go to the next slide? That's why I'm excited to be placed at Consumer Reports. Um, CR is an organization I grew up knowing as an as a advocate for consumers, an organization that values transparency and breaking down purposely hard to understand policy and technical concepts to the greater public. And I'm looking forward with my background in education to support their community development program as we build out privacy and security lesson plans for their members to lead in their homes, libraries, and other public spaces. Um, could we go to the next slide? Thanks. I'm also looking forward to working on an online guidebook for security practitioners who want to work with under-resourced community organizations. Um, and even though I'm excited about all of those things, uh, this work is not about products, software, platforms. Um, I just don't believe applications are just, they're, they're not going to save us. Uh, could we go to the next slide? So, oh, my slide is kind of messed up, sorry about that. Um, but at the trainings I organize, I let my community know that today it's about giving themselves permission to not be perfect. So I lay out three goals for folks. One goal is first, take care of yourself. There's no way to be 100% digitally secure and or safe. This work is not about increasing anxiety around technology, which I think security culture is really focused on that. Um, it's an opportunity to see ourselves as agents of our own liberation. Number two, take care of your networks. We're only as safe as our community. Um, my belief is that if our networks are not engaged in intentionally developing better digital security practices, then we are as insecure as they are. And our security is bound together, as is our liberation. And number three, take care of your practice. So I tell people, trust yourself. This work is iterative. Um, just like software is iter iterative. That means what we value can change, the circumstances of our lives change, and our threats, that means our threats can change. So um, if we can go to the next slide. I can, I can never leave a place without talking about speculative fiction and science fiction, which I'm very excited to join you all in Toronto for folks who are interested. Um, the value of change brings me to this quote from Octavia Butler. Uh, all that you touch, you can you change. All that you change changes you. And she goes on to say that on, that the only constant is change. Um, I hold on to this to say I'm not an expert. I'm a practitioner of things. I'm here because of the amazing networks, chosen family, and folks that I have met in passing. Um, if my communities did not believe change was possible, we would not survive. Uh, so that's why. Um, if we can just move to slide seven. Um, that's why I just want to say that I look forward to building with Mozilla and especially um, my cohort and just look forward to collaborating. I've definitely heard from uh, many of the presentations are um, there's a lot of possibilities for collaboration. So I thank you all and I'm excited to join you in a few hours and that's why I'm going to run to the airport. Thank you so much, Slammer. So I, really briefly, we do have a 1 p.m. Um, presentation by MoCo that has to start at 1 p.m. So for the remaining speakers, if we can stick to the, the quick um, presentations, that'd be wonderful. And I'll get out of my way. Hi, everyone. I'll try to do that. Um, although um, to explain and introduce my fellowship project, I would first like to take you back to 1989. Um, in 1989, in my country, Czechoslovakia, there was a revolution um, that ended 40 years of communist rule, which was a very, very oppressive regime um, based on propaganda, censorship, and disinformation. 
So I was only 10 years old and I didn't understand a lot of what was going on, but I remember this great energy and this um, sense of freedom and possibility and opportunity. And it was really a life changing, life defining moment. Um, and then 10 years later, when internet was starting to become more available, um, it brought similar energy and uh, it just to me felt like this natural expansion or natural progress of, you know, just democracy and freedom getting, getting more and more open and um, it really felt like okay, you know, truth and love really have won and it's only going to get better from there, right? And so what happened? Um, today, the the public square really looks very, I mean, I don't know if you can see it on the picture, but the public square is very, very different um, from, from 1989. And we don't seem to agree on who's lying. We don't seem to even agree on what truth is. And hate seems somehow more visible or amplified. And so is it even possible in the, the, these conditions uh, for truth and love to, to prevail? Well, after hearing uh, many of your presentations, I, I hope that it is. And uh, I'm also going to try and contribute to this. And um, I work with governments, with communities, um, with international organizations to design and implement strategies to tackle hate, extremist radicalization and violence. Um, and an important part of, of these strategies is dealing with harmful content that fuels these things. Um, it is an important part, but not the only part. On the other hand, um, Presently, I have a feeling that the, the, our discussions about policies regarding harmful content um, are so narrow, narrowly focused on um, how much we can remove and how fast that we are somehow missing all of these important angles and points of conversation. And um, we are risking not only that these policies are not going to be effective, uh, but that they might actually be counterproductive in reducing real world harms. And what's worse, they might actually damage internet and negatively affect our individual rights. So there, there are a lot of, lot of risks involved. And so in my fellowship um, project, I wanna expand this conversation and um, I wanna do it by introducing voices and perspectives that are currently missing, um, and especially from like, post-conflict countries and, and fragile countries um, where, where these problems are, are very visible. Um, and to finish off, I really believe that this challenge is not about what we can, how we can do more to remove harmful content, but what what more we can do than, than remove content. And I hope to be pondering and, and brainstorming on that with you in the next 10 months. Thank you. Thank you so much. So because we have uh, such a tight deadline with this other presentation that's following and they need a bit of time to set up in here, um, I'm going to unfortunately have to leave the people in our room in suspense as our last three presenters will go immediately after this 1 to 2 p.m. presentation today. This whole day is recorded and for those who cannot watch later, um, everything will be conjoined together. So uh, later on, we'll send out a link with a full connected all of the uh, fellows presentations. So with that being said, um, I welcome folks who came in to, to come back at 2 p.m. or just stay here for this 1 p.m. presentation. Um, for those who are here right now, since we are expecting about 60 guests to watch this presentation as it is public, um, if you can clean up your area and feel free to go have lunch in the kitchen area. Thank you so much. And for those who are watching, we'll see you back at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard.